Welcome to All Home Care Matters, the show where we discuss all things home care with discussions on important age-related matters and topics. Brought to you by Enriched Life Home Care Services, the number one rated home care provider in Michigan by top rated local. Hello, and welcome back to All Home Care Matters. If this is your first time visiting us here at the show, we want to say thank you for taking time out to be with us today. We appreciate how valuable everyone's time is, and that's why we try and make each episode here at All Home Care Matters something that will hopefully matter to you. Today, we are honored to welcome a remarkable guest, Jonathan Hunt Glassman, the co-founder and CEO of Or Health. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Lance. It's great to be here. Our pleasure. You know, Jonathan, before we kind of jump into it, uh, I said, or health. Is that a play on words? <laughs> um, it's a bit of a metaphor. Okay. Um, you know, we are a telemedicine solution that helps people get access to a daily pill to drink less or quit. And for many folks, that can be like someone handing them an or uh, when they're in a tumultuous part of their life. Okay. All right. Um, well, let's uh, let's start off with tell us a little bit about your background and um, what exactly Or Health is. Sure. So I've worked in healthcare my whole career as a product manager, as a strategy consultant, in house at a few large insurance companies, and then in parallel to that fairly traditional career trajectory, I also struggled with alcohol misuse myself for all of my adult life. What started as binge drinking in high school and college became a pattern of drinking to blackout. And then in my late 20s and early 30s, as I saw peers of mine start to put that sort of excessive alcohol use behind them, the opposite was happening for me. I was drinking more and more and experiencing more and more of the negative consequences. Uh, and so it was no secret to me that I had a drinking problem over these 15 years or so sought help in a lot of places, but what ultimately turned the corner for me was access to safe, effective prescription medication that can help people drink less or quit. And that was transformational for me, but also opened my eyes uh, to the reality that there are many millions of people who have not gotten access to this same safe, effective tool. And so that's what we're trying to do at Or Health is to make access to medication-assisted treatment for alcohol use disorder as accessible as possible. Uh, Jonathan, just to kind of drill in a little bit on your story, you know, um, I, I personally, I, I don't drink. You know, I don't judge people that, you know, do or don't. But, you know, some people, they say, are able to drink and it doesn't lead to further complications or addictions, if you will. What was yours just more socially and then it became more of an issue or was there something going through your personal life that contributed to, you know, more of a consumption on a regular basis? I struggled with alcohol from the first time I drank, um, you know, which was in the context of a high school party where I certainly, you know, felt some social anxiety. So yes, there were things going on in my life where alcohol was very present and accessible. Um, and, um, I really, really liked it. And it really, at least in the moment, allayed that social anxiety. So binge drinking became a pattern very early on at the same time. Um, it wasn't one constant level of struggle or one linear progression towards rock bottom. It was a bit more up and down. And certainly in times of stress or difficult emotions related to work or romantic relationships or just feeling depressed or anxious in general, alcohol use and its negative consequences went up, which is a, a fairly typical pattern. Yeah. You know, and you kind of touched on something, you know, work, stress, you know, situational relationship issues, you know, with with caregivers and families, you know, we encounter countless, you know, families and family caregivers on a regular daily basis. And they're going through some very tumultuous times in their lives, you know, sometimes good, sometimes negative. And, you know, it, it there seems to be some studies that suggest that caregivers are more likely to misuse alcohol. Why, why do you think that is? What makes caregivers unique to this situation? 
Well, that finding does not surprise me, unfortunately, because it's consistent with a broader body of research that shows that when we're experiencing stress, disruption, dislocation, difficult emotions, these all tend to be predictors of increased alcohol use. And some people increase their alcohol use in a way that may not be optimal, but isn't a huge problem either. A percentage will begin misusing alcohol, you know, creating harms of some sort to those and those around them. And a subset of those will develop alcohol use disorder, um, which is a pattern of being unable to control or stop drinking despite negative social professional health consequences. You know, a lot of us went through these sorts of stressors and disruptions during the pandemic. And as a consequence, we saw alcohol use increase in the United States um, in significant ways. But caregivers, I would imagine, are feeling a lot of these things every day. Uh, difficult emotions, um, you know, associated with the, the health of a loved one, um, having to change their daily routine, maybe having less time and energy for the relationships and people that are most important to them and that can be sources of positive energy. So it is very consistent with everything we know about alcohol use and the risk factors for it, that caregivers would have a higher than average risk of alcohol misuse and then downstream of that alcohol use disorder. Yeah. Now, let's. I want to talk about the audience because we have a, a high population and numbers of people that are family caregivers that watch and listen to the show, as well as a lot of professionals in the healthcare community. But if someone in our audience is concerned about their alcohol use or or a loved one's, how can you tell if they have a problem? You know, what's the difference between just having like a one off where maybe you overdrank to this is more of a regular pattern we're seeing? Like, how do you define a problem versus a one off situation where somebody maybe just, like I said, had too much to drink over the, you know, at the party or when they went out? A really good place to start is the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder. Um, AUD is defined as an impaired ability to stop or control drinking despite adverse consequences, professional, health, social, and so on. Now, technically, only a healthcare professional can diagnose AUD, but the criteria are not difficult to understand. They consist of 11 yes or no questions. Things like, have you tried to stop or cut back unsuccessfully? Are you, is alcohol contributing to a health problem, mental health or physical? Um, are you needing to drink more and more to get the same effect? Answering yes to any of these questions uh, is cause for concern. Um, typically, AUD is diagnosed based on the presence of two or more of the 11 symptoms. And then if we're starting to get up into the mid single digits, the double digits, uh, that alcohol use disorder may be classified as moderate or severe uh, rather than mild. The good news is all of these forms of a problem um, are amenable to treatment and um, certainly um, recovery is possible from any severity of alcohol use disorder. Um, one example of that, uh, there are millions more. Yeah. Um, and if you don't mind, you know, and I and I applaud you and I, I admire that you're willing to, you know, talk about your personal story and journey, you know, with alcoholism. Uh, when did you realize you had a problem? Was it from friends, family? Like where when did you hit that point where you're like, I can't keep going on like this? What what was really the trigger for that? Well, it wasn't a big secret to me <laughs> over the 15 years that I was misusing alcohol. Um, and so I actually sought treatment a lot of times along the way in a lot of the places that first come to mind, Alcoholics Anonymous, primary care, individual psychotherapy, the emergency department without a whole lot of planning on that one. And pretty much was always told the same thing, which was you need to stop drinking entirely and start going to meetings. And so I would try that and it, it just didn't fit me. What was much more of a turning point um, was I did have a pretty scary um, um, acute health episode where um, after you know several days of drinking continuously, I felt this kind of mysterious pain in my abdomen, which if you have a drinking problem is something you worry about, especially if it's on the side of your body where your liver is, which it was in my case. 
It turned out um, it was prob that pain was probably more likely caused by doing some ab exercises that were new. But the point is, it got me into the doctor's office, and the clinician that I saw, you know, told me, of course, yeah, we'll do some imaging on on, on to figure out what's going on. But I really want you to meet with this colleague of mine who was kind of the practice's go-to guy for people struggling with addiction. And he did a few things that felt very different than those previous uh, attempts that I'd made. One is he accepted my goal of cutting back uh, without quitting and did so non-judgmentally, both in his words and probably more importantly, in the look on his face. And then secondly, he suggested prescription medication as a tool in the toolkit to achieve that goal, which was also brand new. And uh, I let that bottle sit on my shelf for about a month. Um, but ultimately, once I started taking it alongside uh, clear goals and, and practical strategies to cut back and, and meet my, my goal, um, it was really transformational. I felt like I was able to get control back over alcohol rather than alcohol having control over me. Did you find that like having a support group did that did you continue with that after you started the medication or how did that because you know doing it on your own is very difficult I, I would imagine did you find any sort of groups or things that would help encourage you and kind of be there as your support throughout you know this process so in the past i had you know as i said gone to aa and and gone to therapy in this you know successful attempt that began about seven or eight years ago uh, at this point, I did not engage in uh, either mutual peer support or professional behavioral health care. Um, I think I certainly used some of the valuable lessons and strategies uh, from the past. Um, what was more critical to me kind of in this successful attempt were really two things. One was kind of building my own clear plan. I set a kind of bright line goal of no more blackouts uh, that was very meaningful to me because that is what I associated with most of the, the bad uh, things that, that characterized my relationship with alcohol. And also some practical strategies um, to, to avoid those blackouts. So no more shots, um, no more than one drink before eating something, <laughs> fairly substantial. And then... To your question, I definitely did have support, even if it wasn't from necessarily the groups that we think of. Uh, right. In my case, it was from my my partner, my wife, um, who I could kind of count on to be kind of a little bit of a friendly early warning system if she saw me starting to approach what she recognized as a danger zone. And then secondly, over time, um, sharing my, my goal and my progress with close friends who I trusted to be supportive. And so to me, the kind of takeaway of this complex, somewhat messy history is that there's no one size fits all solution in terms of a recovery toolkit. And even an individual um, may adjust their toolkit over time, um, putting in some things, taking out others, adjusting the intensity up in particularly challenging times, ramping it down as, as change becomes more locked in and sustainable. Yeah. And I, I love what you said. There is, I don't think there is a hard, fast rule that applies across the board. And I asked that question thinking of, you know, caregivers. Caregivers often feel very lonely and very isolated. And they may not feel it, but they may not know that they're feeling it. I Rather, I should say, when you're caring for a spouse, a parent, or even a child with special needs, in your social circle may not be experiencing that it's very hard to get the understanding and the you know the sympathy or even you know necessarily even empathy from them because they haven't gone through what you what you're going through you know i see a similarity kind of with what you're saying you know you shared with your close friends and you know your 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 wife if they weren't going through it you know it's hard to necessarily appreciate what you are experiencing and having to deal with caregivers it's often the same you know we encourage them to join support groups but now imagine there's a, a high propensity for caregivers to develop some sort of an addiction you know for the sake of this conversation we're talking about alcohol and they already have a hard time getting people to relate and understand what they're going through caring for a spouse caring for a parent 
if none of their friends or their circle is having to go through that. And now you add this addiction component on top of that, there could be maybe fairly or unfairly some shame associated with that as well. So now they don't even feel like they can express that to their friend or their social circle. And now they're feeling even more isolated and more alone. What, you know, so what do you, you know, it seems like there's about 10% of people with alcohol use disorder get treatment. What are some of the, you know, I might have mentioned some of them and you may have mentioned some of them, but 10%, Jonathan, out of 100, that's not very good. You're not going to pass any classes at 10% of your grade. How can people survive that? Like, what is the barriers and how can we help remove some of those barriers so there's not this stigma associated with it? There's not this feeling of maybe shame or guilt. How do we how do we help remove those barriers? But what are some of the other barriers that are there preventing them from seeking help? You certainly hit on some important ones, um, a sense of shame, failing, sometimes we call that stigma, um, inconvenience, uh, which I think, you know, may be especially relevant for people who've recently taken on an additional uh, responsibility like caretaking, um, cost, some options are free, some are very expensive, uh, lack of confidence that the treatment is going to work or that it's evidence-based. Unfortunately, this field does not have a history of always following the evidence. We're getting better, but it's not the, not the legacy. And so some skepticism is warranted. I think my advice would be to, to do a little research on the options that are available because they are often more diverse and varied than one might expect. And so if the options that are first coming to mind feel like a bad fit, if going to inpatient rehab for 28 days seems entirely inconsistent with the circumstances of one's life, given all the responsibilities and stresses of the moment, it's not the only option. If Alcoholics Anonymous, which is effective for many of the reasons that you described how important peer support is, but if Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't feel right, um, because of the religious component or not wanting to abstain entirely, there are other options in the same bucket. Moderation management, um, smart recovery are a bit more secular, um, a bit more evidence-based, and so maybe a good fit for some with um, preferences or values that are, that are, that are different. Uh, the, the point here is you don't have to become an encyclopedia of every treatment option under the sun, um, but because there are more out there than we've kind of been led to believe or see on television, the odds are is that there is one that's a good fit. Um, and you know that's certainly what we're hoping to achieve at Or Health is to address some of these barriers through the power of telemedicine, following the clinical guidelines on what people should be offered, medication as a frontline option, and then making it available in a convenient 24 seven online format so whenever that right moment is, um, even if it's as you're kind of falling asleep, <laughs> exhausted, uh, you can still get started. You know, I want to touch on another statistic that I find really kind of shocking, but maybe maybe to you it isn't, and you can explain why it's not if, if you're not shocked by this, but we talked about the 10% of people with alcohol use disorder get treatment. That leaves 90% who are going without treatment or without any sort of intervention. But then out of that 10%, it seems like only 2% of people with alcohol use disorder are even prescribed the medication to help them. Why is that? Well, unfortunately, there's plenty of room uh, to apportion blame on this one. Um, you're right that, you know, only about 2 to 3% of people with alcohol use disorder are prescribed any sort of medication to help them drink less. So that means that, you know, of the 10% that are getting into treatment, most of them aren't getting medication that could help with their problem. I think there are really three big reasons. One is that these medications, although safe and effective, have been generic uh, since before direct-to-consumer pharma advertising got going. Mm -hmm. And so there's no pharmaceutical company that has the economic incentive to make these household names like Viagra or Prozac might be. So money is one. Money. Yep. Always a good, always a good first guess. Um, number two is physicians and other healthcare professionals still don't get enough training on how to deal with addiction, given how often it's going to come up in their panels. 
Um, and so some don't feel comfortable or confident treating alcohol use disorder in their offices. Um, I've had members tell me about being handed a pamphlet for AA or told you need to go to a more specialized facility. There's nothing wrong with those options, um, but they neglect the, the tools that any physician has at their fingertips, uh, namely their prescription pad or these days their EMR. And then lastly, um, there is still a little bit of a stigma in some corners of the recovery industry around medication-assisted treatment. You still hear the phrase, don't replace one drug with another now and then. And it just doesn't make a lot of sense to me, especially when it comes to medications like naltrexone for alcohol use disorder, which are not subject to abuse, not habit forming, not addictive. Uh, yes, it's a drug in one sense, um, but not in the in the sense that you might get uh, addicted to it. So we're making progress on on all three of those, but long way to go. And you know, it's dissatisfaction with that status quo that the the statistic you described captures. Uh, the was one of the reasons to start a company like Our Health. We're hoping we can be part of uh, you know changing that statistic over time. Yeah, and I want to talk about Or Health here in a moment because uh, I just I, I, like I said I, I applaud you and I applaud the work that you guys are doing. I, I think it's desperately needed. Um, I think we need to remove stigma, not just with alcoholism, but, you know, opioid addiction, all, all of these things, because I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, it, it it's not the person at some point it becomes the, the drug of choice that's making the decisions almost for the person because they almost lose that, you know, ability to decide once that, you know, addiction kind of takes over. I don't know if that's fair or if you'd agree with that, but when when I'm looking at the statistic of only 2% getting a prescription, I'm wondering also, and even with the 10%, I, I, how much of those percentages would change? And I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Jonathan. If, if a person goes in, if I go into my doctor, let's, let's say, you know, I had a really rough night and I, I just, you know, overdrank and I, I'm feeling sick. And, you know, you mentioned feeling that, you know, tenderness or soreness or pain in your abdomen and they've been going to their primary for, you know, 10, 20, 30 plus years. They know the family. They take care of this, you know, the family's kids, the parents, the grandparents. Would that person feel comfortable outing themselves? And I'll use the word outing because if the doctor is not aware of this issue, if they don't tell the doctor, the doctor can't offer to treat it, right? I mean, how many of these people would not feel comfortable even telling their primary care doctor out of embarrassment and shame? Unfortunately, that that is common. Um, the you know, in an ideal world, every primary care physician would screen all of their adult patients once a year for alcohol misuse, and then be prepared to offer the full menu of evidence-based treatment options: medication, professional behavioral health care, mutual peer support. But we don't live in an ideal world. Uh, we talked about how physicians are not always prepared um, to have that conversation, but you're right that neither are patients. Um, that um, can sometimes be because they're embarrassed um, to, to share the information. Sometimes it can be because they lack confidence in the provider. And then sometimes uh, they don't have a primary care provider. We can't we can't take that um, for, for granted uh, either. Um, it, it's a bit of a frustrating um, situation in that, you know, for decades at this point, you know, our, our uh, NIH and other government funded um, entities have been saying, screen, 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 offer all the options. And, um, you know, our, our clinical advisor has said to me, well, we could keep writing journal articles and wait 30 years, or we could try to do something about it directly, which is kind of where Aura Health comes in, which is for some people, um, even if in an ideal world, that would be a conversation with their primary care provider, um, being able to meet with a clinician who's experienced in treating the disorder, familiar with the relevant medications, and doing so online um, in what maybe someone may never have to see uh, in person 
can be a better way to get started. Ideal world, it would all happen in primary care. Um, but we're, of course, living in a world where we have to balance relative um, you know, benefits and, and, and trade-offs. And given the that the biggest problem in this whole field is 90% of people not getting treatment at all, where I come down is that any front door is a good front door. Yeah. Uh, before we talk about OR Health in a little more detail, what recommendations or tips or resources do you offer and recommend for people who may want to drink less or quit, but they're not sure where to get the help or the support from? What What do you suggest to them? Yeah, so you can get a, a great overview of the options through the National Institute on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, the NIAAA. Um, all sorts of uh, resources to kind of ask yourself, go through that exercise of asking yourself, uh, is there cause for concern here? If so, what treatment options exist, which might be um, a good fit for me and where do I find them? The CDC and the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration uh, also have good resources. And then, um, you know, we provide free of charge a kind of overview of all the options with a deep dive on medication specifically. Um, and so folks can email me or message me on LinkedIn to get a copy of that. Sure. And I want to put these websites up on the screen as you're talking about them. So the N-I-A-A-A, is that a dot gov, dot org, dot com? It's going to be a, a, a dot gov. Yeah, exactly. Don't hold me to the exact um, URL, but essentially that's the component of the National Institutes uh, on health, of health um, that uh, focus exclusively on alcohol issues. They're kind of like, that's where your taxpayer dollars are going in terms of addressing the, the science on alcohol use disorder. And CDC is .gov. And how about OR Health? Because we're about to talk about OR Health. What's, uh, what's your website so we can- Sure, you can find us at orhealth.com. That's O-A-R health.com. And we have all sorts of information and resources um, focused most deeply on understanding what is alcohol use disorder and what is medication assisted treatment. We don't take for granted that either one of those is a uh, household term. So if this is the first time that someone's hearing those words, those acronyms, uh, don't feel alone. Yeah, absolutely. We don't want anybody to feel alone. You know, I, I'm, we're especially talking about family caregivers here, Jonathan. And, you know, I, I fondly, you know, always mention this at least once or twice a year here on the show. Uh, we facilitate multitude of caregiver support groups throughout southeastern mm -hmm. Michigan. And one of our facilitators was at one and we had a new lady come in and she sat there, you know, as you can probably appreciate and didn't really say anything for the whole meeting. And, you know, just very, you know, very pleasant. The following month, you know, she came back again, which is always a good sign, you know, that they return. And she was very distraught, had Kleenex, was teary eyed. And the facilitator who was running it had asked her, you know, what is wrong? And again, but don't feel like you have to talk. You can just, you know, sit and listen and, you know, take in everything. And she had actually shared that, friends of her and her husband for and this goes all the way back to like middle school high school and they're in their 50s 60s now they grew up together you know they did everything together every week they would go to dinner or a movie and um the past i forget four or five six months uh this lady and her husband could not go so that's you know let's say four months four fridays or saturdays a month that's you know 16 18 times that they kept bailing and her friend of you know 40 plus, 50 plus years, whatever it was, got really kind of nasty for a lack of a better way of saying it and said, well, if, you know, if you don't want to be friends with us or you're too good or, you know, whatever it was, uh, really, really hurt this woman. And, you know, our facilitator had said to her, you know, don't, don't begrudge your friend and don't resent her because she can't understand what you and your husband are going through. This woman for the past 12 months, 16 months, she had been caring for her husband who was diagnosed with uh, dementia. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, she's explaining to the group, as I was told, that I can't take him in public anymore. You know, he, A, doesn't want to change his clothes, okay, wears the same outfit, maybe for weeks at a time or what have you. And, you know, his very inappropriate with his talk, you know, totally opposite of who this person used to be. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, the facilitator had said, 
your friend can't understand that because thankfully, you know, her and her husband aren't going through something like this and they, they didn't understand dementia. And a lot of people don't who really, they might have an idea, but they don't understand the more intricate, you know, aspects of it. And they said, just write your friend a letter when you've calmed down and you're more clear headed and you're not so emotional and just explain to her exactly what you've been living and going through and maybe she can have a better appreciation for it and but don't don't hate her don't be mad at her don't resent her because if you haven't gone through it yeah you might you might think that you know because you don't know any better and uh but i, I kind of related to like our conversation today with you know if you're going through a dependency on alcohol a you're, you're probably like we said may have some shame or you know guilt even and um you, you don't know how to go and talk to a close friend. But if, I always say to people, if they're your close friend, they may not have experience with it, but they will be there for you regardless, because that's what a close mm-hmm. friend is for, or a family member. Um, and it, I just find it so difficult for, you know, especially for caregivers, because a lot of them don't have that circle already built in where they can call a close friend or someone, you know, at their school, church, work, whatever, and say, yeah, you know, that's what I'm going through now, or this is what happened. And that's why I think these support groups, you know, either virtually or in person can be so beneficial because if if nothing else, and you don't even go to another one, at least now you've kind of almost proven to yourself, I'm not alone. There are other Mm -hmm. people going through search, you know, certain situations It may not be identical, but they will be familiar to what I'm going through. And I think that helps in and of itself, if nothing else. Yeah, that was certainly my experience um, as I started telling people um, what, the, what, what I was going through. Of course, significant anxiety about doing so. Um, but as is often the case, uh, the imagined worst case scenario is much less worse than reality. Um, in my case, uh, there were very few, if any, people who were surprised to hear that I had a drinking problem. It's pretty obvious to them. And, you know, as you said, you know, although it may be difficult for those who haven't had a similar experience to relate to every aspect of it, I think you will find generally true friends who are willing to lend an ear and be supportive in the ways that they can. They may not be perfect. None of us are are perfect in any of our uh, endeavors, but I certainly found it to be a way, way, way less scary and significantly more uh, helpful experience to rip the bandaid off and um, ask for help. You know, we all we all need some help at some point in our lives. And I think that's probably the hardest part is first, you know, they say, you know, first admit you have a problem. Um, I think for most people, that's probably one of the hardest first steps, I would imagine. It, it, it certainly can be. And then uh, even once you've admitted to yourself, uh, telling those around you is the difficult step uh, uh, number two. And sometimes that to the point of the efficacy of mutual support that, that can inherently um, be easier in a group of people who share common issues and who are, you know, to some extent anonymous. And and non-judgmental, I would imagine also. Right. Yeah. So let's talk about Or Health, Jonathan, your co-founder and CEO. Um, how does Or Health work and how are you helping to connect people with treatment to, you know, get them the help they need? So our main goal is to make access to a daily pill to drink less or quit uh, easier, simpler. Uh, The way that we do that is people come to our website, orhealth.com. As I mentioned, they can learn uh, first about alcohol use disorder, medication-assisted treatment, associated topics. If that starts to feel like it might be a good tool in their toolkit for changing their relationship with alcohol, Right from our website, they can begin a virtual consultation with a doctor or nurse practitioner who's licensed in their state. Uh, That healthcare professional will collect information, um, form a treatment plan with recommendations that are likely to include some of the forms of psychosocial support we've talked about. And then when appropriate, um, can also include a prescription for a medication called naltrexone. 
Naltrexone is the recommended frontline medication for the treatment of AUD. The way that it works is it binds to certain receptors in our brain that are integral to the reward and pleasure pathways that alcohol activates. And so when we take naltrexone, uh, alcohol may be less rewarding, making it easier to stop after one or two drinks. We may have fewer thoughts and excitement about alcohol in general, fewer cravings. And so over time, um, it is possible that we'll uh, have fewer days drinking at all. Um, and, you know, begin to be able to control again, how much we're drinking, thereby lessening the, all those adverse consequences that we talked about, get back in control would be another, another way to put it. Um, the medication is something that folks can get at their local pharmacy or what a lot of folks opt for is having one of our partner pharmacies ship it to them directly, um, which is a convenient, reliable, discreet, uh, option. And then although our main focus is on medication, we do offer some additional support tools, things to help people form their plan and their toolkit, stick to taking their medication, for example, uh, connect with other or health members through a private online uh, community. So tapping into some of those um, mutual peer support benefits that we were talking about. Some find it especially helpful to have a community of folks who are by and large, taking the same medication. Uh, as we talked about, there aren't a lot of folks out there taking this in general. So finding those who are, who can compare notes or look back on their experiences can be very helpful. And then finally, we do host a um, weekly live um, smart recovery uh, meeting facilitated by, by a mental health uh, professional. I, I'm gonna ask, and, I, and I'm sure it is, um, and that's all HIPAA compliant, right? Yeah, so it's, well, let me answer it this way. Um, we, you know, take member privacy very, very um, seriously. And rather than opine as a lawyer um, here, I would, you know, encourage folks to read through our privacy policy, contact us at privacy at orhealth.com if they have questions. The reason I'm giving you less than an absolute yes um, answer there is HIPAA is a very, is very specific about who it applies to and who it doesn't. Gotcha. But it's secure and it's, uh, yeah, but it's secure. Yeah, we've made significant investments in, you know, protect. We know that one of the main reasons people come to us is for um, privacy and security in their treatment. Um, and, you know, while there's no no 100% um, secure thing out there, um, we do believe we are, um, you know, one of the most secure places to get treatment. Wonderful. I, you know, I, I saw that you have helped more than 35,000 people through Or Health, which is phenomenal. You know, again, kudos to you guys. Out of curiosity, out of that 35,000, have there been any caregivers that have received help and support? Absolutely. Um, there's one who comes to mind who I'd love to tell you a little about. Oh, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, she has given us permission to share her story in the hope that it helps others. I'll just call her Katie for the purposes of this conversation. Sure. Um, she, you know, was someone who had experienced, you know, had, at times in her life tried to cut back on her drinking and felt like she'd made progress in that direction, but then needed to take on a caretaking role with her mother who was in the advanced stages of dementia. And so this involved feeding, uh, changing clothes, transportation, uh, cleaning, all sorts of responsibilities. It also meant real disruption in her life in that her mother lived out of state. And so she had to change where she was living and be away from her husband and teenage daughter and also hold down her day job working remotely uh, rather than in office. So a lot going on. Not surprisingly, uh, this brought up some difficult emotions. And as a consequence, she started drinking um, each night and more. In her words, her drinking skyrocketed. And although initially it felt like a way to tamp down some of the difficult emotions that were coming up, sometimes we call that self-medicating, what Katie realized over time was that this, the drinking was actually exacerbating or amplifying, in her words, the emotions and not serving as a route to processing them in, in healthier ways. And so she decided she needed to make a, a big change um, in, in her drinking, 
set the goal of sobriety and started looking into options. And for the first time, um, heard about medication and, and medication from ore as a tool to do that. Went through the process on our website um, that I described, got a prescription sent to her and got started. And um, you know, the last time she checked in with us, she was about a month um, into sobriety and wow. you know, feeling a lot better about her ability to handle um, the responsibilities and challenges in her life, which had not disappeared. Um, but felt much more addressable without alcohol pulling in the other direction. That, that's phenomenal. Jonathan, for you, who, you know, is uh, recovered from alcoholism and you help find, you know, found this company as a co-founder and you deal with, you know, 35,000 plus people. When you hear stories like that, like what is the personal feeling that you get? It's definitely the most rewarding part of the job. Um, as I, I don't have to tell you, entrepreneurship has its ups and downs. Um, but what I've found is um, when I'm in need of an energy recharge, the best thing to do is to read back, uh, is to read from some of the feedback that we've gotten from our members. What we offer at Or Health is not a silver bullet. Um, it, is, it does not have a 100% success rate, um, but it is really rewarding to remind myself um, that we have helped, uh, you know, baseball stadium size worth of people get started. And that for many of them, the changes in their life have been, you know, nothing short of revolutionary. That's incredible. I, I know we touched on this earlier, but just again, for our viewers and listeners, if someone wants to learn more about medication from or that can help them to drink less or even quit, where do you want them to go? Best place to start is orhealth.com, O-A-R health.com. One uh, feature that we haven't mentioned that I would highlight for people yeah. there is they can click on the button that says our story. And then um, from there, schedule 15 minutes to chat with me just as, as we're doing. There's, there's no charge for that. I'm happy to do that with anybody who's thinking through these difficult issues. Um, and and I know there's a multitude of factors that play into it, but you had said it's obviously nothing I don't believe is a silver bullet for things like this necessarily. But for somebody who who has attempted using the medication and, you know, went through the program and, you know, got your support and it doesn't work, is that because the medication doesn't work with their body for genetic reasons or is it because the person doesn't follow through on things they're supposed to do? Like, what's a reason for a, an unsuccessful outcome? Terrific question. Um, we don't have, as a field, um, as authoritative answers on that as, as we would like. There are definitely hypotheses that naltrexone, while the recommended frontline medication, while uh, effective relative to a placebo, may or may not work better for certain people with either different genetics or different um, patterns of alcohol use, but we need more research to be more definitive um, about that. You know, sometimes I hear about precision medicine and it, uh, while in some fields that may be where we're getting um, in alcohol use disorder, that sounds like science fiction. We have a lot more research to do um, to develop more precise options. Uh, in some cases, sure, like, you know, like most medications, it works better if you take it. Um, and so that's something we work hard on um, at or is helping our members get over whatever the barriers um, to adherence um, might be. And, you know, then I think lastly and thirdly, there's probably a category of people for whom the medic they're taking the medication regularly. Um, they're, um, they're, they're doing everything that they can. And there's just so much pulling the other way um, in their life um, that they're not making all of the progress that they wished. Um, in any of these cases where results are inadequate or, or insufficient, um, the takeaway is not to give up. The takeaway is to change something. Um, so if we're not taking our medication regularly, start taking it regularly. Um, perhaps change to a different medication or add on an additional medication explore other forms of support. Would adding mutual peer support once a week or once a day um, help? Do we need to change the goal? Abstinence versus moderation. Um, the, the good news here is there are a lot of options 
past treatment failure does not indicate that future uh, treatment will also fail. For some folks, there's just a high degree of stick to uh, that that is required. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm assuming or health doesn't give up on the people it's not successful for you guys are probably staying by them as, as long as you can. We will do whatever we can. You know, there are certain forms of treatment that we're not set up to provide. We do not have an inpatient rehabilitation facility. Um, so if that feels like it's the right next step for a particular patient, we're happy to make recommendations. We know some good folks, um, but, you know, we kind of have to balance Here's what we're trying to get um, people started with, the recommended frontline medication. So best place to start for most people, um, while also recognizing that as, as your you know questions highlight, um, that's not gonna be the end all and be all um, for everybody. Um, which, so we try to be humble about that and where necessary and appropriate connect people with other options along the continuum of care. Yeah, well, uh, Jonathan, I want to kind of wrap up here first again, just applauding you guys again for this tremendous work. It's so needed. And I think it's probably make as well, the 35,000 plus people would probably attest to as well. It's, it's having profound lasting impacts, not only on the individuals, but their families as well. So thank you again for that. And just keep doing the great work that you guys are doing at or health. Uh, In closing, are there any last words that you would like to share or leave the audience with? First, thanks so much for for having me and using your platform um, to help raise awareness around this tough issue and the options to address it. Let me try to sum up our conversation with three key messages. One is recovery is possible. I'm one example of that. There are millions and millions others. Two, treatment options exist. And I really want to underline the word options there for reasons we've talked about. Different tools are going to fit different people at different points in their life. And then lastly, it's never too early or too late to get started. Uh, You don't have to wait to hit rock bottom. But on the other side of that coin, no matter how dark and difficult things feel right now, improvement and a brighter future are always possible. Well said. Well said. Well, Jonathan Hunt Glassman, CEO and co-founder of Or Health, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today and, you know, sharing the incredible message and work that you guys are doing at Or Health. My pleasure. The reality is people use and misuse alcohol across a broad spectrum. About 140 million American adults drink regularly. Of those, more than 60 million binge drink monthly, and 28 million meet the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder. Across that broad spectrum, our research indicates that as many as 70 million American adults want to drink less or to quit. Thank you for joining us today here at All Home Care Matters. All Home Care Matters is here to help families as they navigate these long-term care issues. We invite you to visit us at allhomecarematters.com, where there's a private, secure, fillable form where you can give us feedback, show ideas, or if you have questions, every form is read and responded to. And remember, you can listen to the show on any of your favorite podcast streaming platforms, or you can watch the show on our official YouTube channel. Just make sure that you hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. We'd also like to say thank you again to Jonathan Hunt Glassman from Or Health for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you next time here at All Home Care Matters. Thank you for joining us today. We look forward to you joining us again on another episode of All Home Care Matters. To learn more about the show and to connect with us, visit us at allhomecarematters.com.